Hello everybody and welcome to the Cyclical Investors Club YouTube channel. Uh, today we are going to be looking at and analyzing Eastman Chemical stock. This one came in by request um, down in the comments section of one of my videos. If you have an S&P 500 stock you would like me to analyze on a YouTube video, just put the request in the comments section and I'll get it on my list and uh, I will make a video of it. Uh, the ones that are in the S&P 500, I'll post for YouTube on free. The other ones I post over on Patreon for $5 a month. And then if you join over there, you get a big discount to my full Cyclical Investors Club service where we have all the spreadsheets, a chat room where you can chat with me. Um, I have descriptions of all my strategies. I have portfolios you can look at, um, all, that, all that good stuff. Um, but for now, we're just going to do Eastman Chemical. And as always, this is not individual investing advice. This is just how I analyze stocks. And Eastman Chemical is a deep cyclical stock, which I'll show you here in a second, which is sort of my specialty um, and what got me started in um, independent stock analysis because so many people I found um, didn't really understand and made a lot of mistakes around deeply cyclical stocks. Um, and I learned that from losing money on a deep cyclical stock about 10 years ago or so. And I tried to figure out what it was that I did wrong. And finally, when I got it figured out, I was like, you know, I, not only could I avoid um, making some bad mistakes, I could also make money on the on the other end. And so I'm a long only investor. I don't short stocks, but um, I do buy a lot of deep cyclical stocks when they're really cheap. And you can do really well on those if you kind of have nerves of steel or you just have a lot of experience um, and understand that the really good ones usually will come back pretty strong. So um, so the first thing I look at is to see what historical earnings cyclicality has been like. Um, for Eastman, usually what I use is to judge it by is whether earnings have had a 50% decline or earnings growth has had 50% decline or more um let's see this one was slightly less than 50 percent but it was spread over such a long time period of 2005 to 2009 um and then they had kind of this small bump here i would consider that a cyclical downturn this doesn't go back beyond 2003 but if you go back there there was another cyclical downturn um actually you can go back i think with these guys to the 70s data wise not on fast graphs but you can on y charts um and then here we have like a 30% decline, and this is just not really a full recession, right? This is just the COVID. It happened. This started happening when the Fed was raising rates, um, and then it never fully recovered before COVID hit. So you kind of got a combination that almost works out to like a full recession, but not as bad as the Great Recession. And now we're in the middle of another one. Um, again, we're looking at like 30, 35% so far. Um, but the market treats the stock price as a deep cyclical. So it always fall, the stock price always falls more than 50%. Even in these times when earnings um, maybe only fall 30 or 40. Part of that is because these guys do have some debt. And so that kind of adds to the cyclical danger to some degree. Um, so, so yeah, even I, I would... I do categorize this as a deep cyclical business. Um, this is a chemical stock, yeah. So chemicals are almost always cyclical. Sometimes you'll get like a specialty chemical that's not quite as cyclical, but um, usually chemical stocks I just treat as, I assume they're gonna at least be moderate cyclical, usually pretty cyclical. And in this case, I can tell the stock price is. So my bias would be, now if I looked and the stock price didn't move very much with this kind of earning cyclicality, um, I might just do a normal earnings analysis, but since I know that it doesn't, then that kind of easily tilts me to the deep cyclical. So if it's a deep cyclical, you basically ignore earnings because they can send the wrong signals. Like if you, if you looked here and I didn't, I didn't warn people about this one in 2018, but I warned people about a bunch of them right in this time. So if you look, you're like, oh, a 13 PE. Well, that's not so bad, you know, but that that's before earnings fall like 30%, right? So they were still at a 13 PE here, even though the price was lower. Um, so that's that's kind of the trick. Or up here, here's the better example. 
So up here, the peak PE was like 14. Well, that doesn't seem too bad when the market's like double that, right? Um, let me get rid of all this stuff. But the problem is you go down here and the PE is only 11. Like it only got just a tiny bit lower PE. Well, that's because earnings fell 30%. So I, I ignore earnings for the purposes of evaluating a deep cyclical stock, but I do want to see if it's a quality deep cyclical or not. And for that, I looked, you really want to see higher earnings peaks after each downturn. This was an industrial recession. So you see they were affected a little bit by that, but they came back and then they had this peak, which was higher. And then it went down and then had this peak of earnings, which was higher. And then if you see the price doing the same thing, higher peak, higher peak, higher peak. That's a sign. And then you can go all the way back here. You can pretty much go all the way back. That's what a quality deep cyclical looks like. That's a good business. They're just in a cyclical industry and they have their ups and downs. Sometimes they'll have bad downs, but usually about 80% of the time they come back if you find this stock that has a good history like this one. Um, so that meets the basic quality standards that I have um, to determine whether I want to buy it. So I do track this one because and I don't track too many. I probably only track like 50 or 60 deep cyclicals right now because a lot of them aren't very high quality. So usually what I do after that point is I go back and I look at these historical drawdowns. A lot of times I go back farther than these three. Um, but for the sake of my spreadsheet, I just post three. And these are just rough estimates. So you can see at 2001, it drew down 62%, 2008 about 75, 2020, 65, this would be like 2018 to 2020 because it had kind of that double dip. Um, so I say, okay, if we have another recession, what would be a good place to buy it? And I figured, well, about 65% off the high, I'll take a shot. So the high price was 130.47, I believe. I'll double check that. 130. Oh, I don't have every year displayed. I was like, I don't see 130 in there anywhere. Okay. Let's try this. Uh, right there it is. Peak in 20, the beginning of 2022, the beginning of the bear market. They were at 130.47, so that's the peak. I want to get to buy at 65% off that high potentially. And so that works out to $45.66, about 39% lower than it is right now. Um, now, I only take like 1% weighted portfolio positions with deep cyclicals, pretty much with everything. Um, sometimes I'll take a second position if I know it can go really deep. I probably wouldn't take a second position with Eastman um, because if they go really deep, then there might be something like wrong. So you kind of have to be, and they can lose another 30, 40, 50% sometimes after you buy them. A lot of times people look at my buy prices, they think I'm nuts and then you buy it and then it drops like another 40% and it's like, okay, you weren't crazy, but you want to get kind of low enough that when it, when it recovers, um, you make a really good return because you might have to wait, you know, three, four or five years for the stock price to recover. So if you buy 60% off the highs and the stock price recovers, you make like what a 200% return, right? Yeah, almost. Yeah. So, and you think, oh, well, if it takes seven years to get 200%, well, that's pretty good still. So, and that, and that's how you help, how I help deal with the volatility sometimes of buying these because everything will be bad. The news will be bad. Um, there'll be the news about the earnings will be horrible. Analysts will be predicting, you know, um, the end of the world and everything's going to be bad. And you just got to plug your nose, step in, buy a little bit and then wait. So that's my strategy with these. One thing I do check on these deeps, I check a lot of things and I'm not going over every single one in this, um, in this video because it's in my spreadsheet. So I probably already looked at at least some of this. But one thing to check is I like to look at debt to equity over time just to make sure it's not higher than it has been historically. And usually I like to see if it's above one, which this is like right at one. If it's above one and it's higher than it has been historically, I might lay off of it or wait till we get deep into like a recession, <laughs> maybe coming out the bottom. So like that might've been the case here in 2008 potentially because they, they had it kind of ramped up more than it had been historically. So, but right now this looks okay to me, even though interest rates are higher. Um, it 
chances are that they should be able to manage through that unless things get like really bad but um so that looks good and then you can look and say okay and this is we can just do an example here so this was a 65 percent decline if you bought here and it peaked at what 112 if, if you bought here and you held it until it was 112 again that's 175 percent return so you can get about a 200 percent return if you buy um, when it's about 65 percent off the high um, I didn't buy it here it might have been close to my buy price at that time I think probably I had the deeper I had the uh, I was aiming for 75 percent off the high then because the I thought this could be and could end up being a, like a depression so I was using very conservative um, numbers during COVID I still bought a lot of stuff but I don't think I got this one so I was probably aiming just slightly lower as my guess either that or I wasn't tracking it I hadn't gotten all my spreadsheets built yet then um, where I can track all this stuff a lot easier so yeah that's my story with Eastman it looks interesting to people I'm sure it's down let's see how far down it is I think I looked at this earlier but so it's down 40 percent but it still needs to go another 40 from here I would say or almost 40 and then you're looking at like really good returns now some people <clears throat> aim for lower returns than me okay and so they think well if I just buy here that's like a hundred percent return right which is true approximately maybe 80 percent if it recovers this old highs but the thing is you might have to hold through like a 60 or 65 percent decline and you might have to wait like another year so when you start adding all that together and you're like well if i get if it takes five years i have to sit through a 65 percent decline and then i get an 80 percent return you know then that doesn't look so great necessarily um and that's another reason why i i aim for those really low low prices and one out of five of these might not survive right so so you never know when something bad is going to happen um, to one of them. And so you want your winners to be big winners. Um, because if you buy here and it doesn't survive, and you buy it 65% off the high and it doesn't survive, you lose the same amount of money. <laughs> but you don't make the same amount of money if they recover. So that's how I think about it. Um, OK, if you found this useful, hit the subscribe button. Um, consider joining the Patreon and the Full Cyclical Investors Club. Message me if you have any questions. Drop them in the comments if you have any requests. And I will see everybody later.